share my screen. All right. So this patient has a long-standing history of pulmonary hypertension. And I don't have, all I had was a 2005, you know, printed on film and digitized CT that did, that showed findings of pulmonary hypertension, but didn't show all these filling defects. And the patient reportedly, I don't have images, but the report had a normal VQ scan some time ago, and now has a CT that looks like this. And there's clearly all this, you know, looks like thrombus or stuff in these pulmonary arteries, very eccentric. There are some distal filling defects that may be acute or subacute, and there's there's clearly what look like subacute hemorrhage infarcts all over the place here. Pleural effusions, you can see her RV is really dilated and thickened. So the question is, is do you guys think this is all in situ thrombus? Um, any any thought about sarcoma, or does anyone think um, anything else? Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know if my Clearly, microphone's on. I can hear you very well. Um, it looks like clot to me. Uh, the way it's adherent to the wall, the right. shape that it's making with the wall. Uh, I have seen clot this exuberant in um, patients with bad pulmonary hypertension. Um, but, you know, is there a component where it's CTEF as well now? Uh, I mean, I have, I, I, we just had a case recently, maybe like two or two or three months ago that looked a lot like this. Mm -hmm. um, and we were trying to debate, you know, is this all in situ thrombus or is there CTEF? I mean, inherently in situ thrombus shouldn't, I think I showed a case didn't I recently where a patient had in situ thrombus, like had, I think I showed on the webinar yeah, a few yeah, you know, yeah. in situ thrombus. And then now we had all these occlusions. And the question is, they were like, well, do we just treat it like in situ thrombus or we go in and clean it out? Right. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I don't think this is sarcoma. Yeah, um, I didn't either. I really think this is it. It because she's had pH for so long, and it's bilateral, and I've never seen a sarcoma. But even and also the thing for the sarcomas, even on that, I think very nicely on that um, image you just showed the coronal. I don't know, coronal or sagittal. Um, th those nice kind of lentiform moon shape where you get that. I, I, you don't usually see, and also in the sagittal, you see that for the other PA. Um, usually, don't see those smooth shapes. Right. The sarcoma cases. Um, you yeah, know, there's more like thron fronds and like. Yeah. So we had a case the other day that looked a lot like this unilateral and had all these fronds. Right. And I was like, oh man, and they were like, well, can you definitely say it's not sarcoma? It changes everything. And I'm like, you know, I'm 90% sure it's clot just because of where it is, it was layering like that, but it had all these fronds. And I'm like, but I don't know. So we did an MRI and it was just clearly clawed. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, that distinction, that fine distinction of like people of P, uh, PAH who develop massive and do thrombus and then, you know, the PEs that develop, is it because these thrombus flick off and embolize or right. is it, unrelated and they're throwing DVTs and how do you classify these? I, I don't think anyone, when I bring it up to our guys, they don't seem to. Yeah. I mean, these are clearly subacute infarcts and there looks like there's a little fresher one down here or some hemorrhage and there right. are some occlusions. Okay. That's kind of what I thought, but I, you know, I could, I, I, I see, you know, it's just a very unusual case to have this much soft yeah. tissue, but that, I, that was my impression. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I will stop with that one. I can show one more real quickly and then we can go on to someone else. Um, if I have time, I'll show my other one. So this is kind of a fun case. So this patient um, is a tetralogy of Fallot, had a pulmonary artery stent here, and then got a, uh, um, a stent revision. And you can see they put another stent in. But what's kind of cool, so they did a stent within a stent. But what's kind of cool is there's these now these little linear metal fragments out in the lung. And I can show them on the lateral too. There, I'll blow it up here. You can see one there, and there's another one somewhere. Anyway, I think what's happened is if you go back to the radiograph of the stent and the stent, you can see there's disruption of the inferior portion of the stent. There's some fractures. So I think when they um, 
looks like when they put the new stent in that some of the fragments came off and embolized in the pulmonary arteries. I don't have a post CT to confirm it, but I can't imagine that's anything else there. Right. That's interesting. Yep. Okay. I'll come back to my third case if there is time. Otherwise, we'll let some other people go. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Um, this is why I don't want to go to me. All right. Who wants to go next? Um, I can go. Or I, I can wait, too. Was that you, Howard? I can go anytime. All right. I'll make you the presenter. There we go. I'll just show uh, three quick ones. Um, this one is uh, just a curiosity. Well, not a curiosity. It's just, um, although actually somewhat backwards. So this is a follow-up CT, and it was actually in the context of a PET CT, in which the interpreting physician was interested in this. And what I'm not showing you is that there was another one in which this was present, but this had increased in size and suggested the possibility of an AVM because certainly there it looks tubular or you can call it rod shaped or you can call it like an earthworm like object or a toothpaste coming out of a tube like object located there associated with very mild FDG avidity, and I think it's going to be around about here that corresponded with that. And what wasn't done was a review of previous examinations and procedures. So here is some months before a CT guided procedure. I can't remember the oncology history but this was a CT guided procedure of a nodule in the lung. And there you can see the needle going in. And then we can see towards the end, the appearance of something here like that. Now that thing of course has increased in size. And the explanation for this is that that is sealant inserted by means of, in this instance, a biosentry sealant system. So after the procedure, they instill the sealant through that, and that's what we're seeing in the lung. So undoubtedly, there is a <clears throat> reaction to the foreign material by macrophages, undoubtedly if you look to me, we'll see giant cells and the like, accounting easily for the FDG ability, I would think. So a basically a plug of material is what this thing is. And a nice explanation for it. it's exactly the same location as I showed you the biopsy needle going in. So that's that case. Does this that, one I saw uh, this morning. Have, it has FDA approval, but does it actually reduce complications? I don't know. I don't know. They claim that it absorbs into the body, but clearly it doesn't absorb entirely. No one who's just sitting there. It's a foreign object. This is one that I actually saw this morning, and I'm not entirely sure that the history is either chest discomfort or they said sternal pain. The context is lung transplantation, which was done some weeks ago. And the finding that was of interest is the pneumomedia steinum. And if we look in the apical hemithorax, there is some air. Now here it's going to be hard to distinguish between actual pleural air versus extra pleural air. But in other locations, such as down here, one can really, I think, conclude extra pleural air, but pneumomediastinum. And then when I typically ask my residents what you think about in this context, they think about where did the air come from? Is it coming from the lung? Is it coming from the bronchial tree? Because there's a problem with the bronchi, the anastomose bronchi, or is there another explanation for the air? Is it coming from the head and neck? Is there reason for that to be present, or even the abdomen or the retroperitoneum? And we talk about the origin of the air, but in this particular 
first person I'll show you, I'm going to bring up the coronal alongside that. A nice observation is if you scroll through this, now this is subtle, so I'm going to mag it up a bit. But if you look up here, you see a little streak of air, so like right here, and I'm going to double click on that and bring it up again. And there are a couple of places where I saw this, which I'm certain is air in an interlobular septum. You can see it's linear, just like that. And there are a couple other places, maybe a little higher, trying to remember where I saw a few up right here, probably right there. A little bit of air in an interlobular septum. So that's substantial evidence for the Macklin. Here we go. There's a nice one. For the Macklin phenomenon being the explanation for the pneumomediastinum. It's not a lot of air. So I presume maybe he was coughing or something, but I'm pretty confident that it's the Macklin phenomenon that is the explanation for it by virtue of seeing air like that. The late Judd Gurney used to call these black lightning bolts of septal emphysema. And of course, one may also see air in the peribronchovascular sheets and so on. But just a nice example of pneumomediastinum from the Macklin phenomenon in this person. This one is, I showed you down. Can I just go for a, a fan? This one over here, I'll show you real quickly. This is a nice supplement to the case that Peter showed not long ago, and perhaps I'm more attuned to this now, and I just recognize it by virtue of having seen it. But it's a nice variation of anatomy where the vertebral artery arises from distal aortic arch and then travels up behind the esophagus, going up to the right side and then to the usual place. So distal aortic arch origin of a right vertebral artery. Just a nice anatomic variant. And I have a case where both vertebral arteries arose from a very similar location, distal aortic arch. Howard, it kind of looks okay. like there's a little diverticum of Comoral there too, doesn't it? Oh, just at the origin of it? Yeah, just, just like right a little there. focal, yeah, yeah. Nothing. Like a tiny yeah, one. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. I was gonna say it's a little infundibulum there because that's one of those things that people occasionally think is like a PAU or maybe trauma in the appropriate setting. But if you when you see the vessel coming off the, the top of it or the, the peak of it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just right there. Like a like a diver to from a common like out pouch, you know, sort of. And the rest of the, the right subclavian is coming off the brachycephalic? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, I'll stop there, Jeff. I have some others I could show if we have time, but I'll stop there for now. All right. Thanks, Howard. All righty. Who wants to be our next presenter? Jeff, I have a couple. All right. Oh. Sorry, Seth. All right. <laughs> okay. Can people see two chest radiographs? <clears throat> yes, so we can. If you can, if you can, you probably realize that the one on the left is the abnormal one and the baseline is the one on the right. That was from October. This is November. And this is a, uh, a neutropenic patient. And we have these bilateral, pretty symmetrical blobs, a little bit bigger on the right than the left. And um, if we scroll through this here on CT, I hope this is not going to be. Uh, delayed scrolling here. It's a little sluggish. We see that That's there good. are the, there's a ground glass surround and then there are these fairly dense nodules here um, on both sides. And sorry that this is a little bulky here because it's pulling it off of a server. Home is not, um, is not ideal. Okay, but a fairly dense consolidation here. So you definitely think about the possibility of fungus. Um, it's got some internal, a little bit of air bronchogram in it, which I take to favor um, bacterial infection over fungal infection like Aspergillus or Mucor, but it's not very persuasive. 
and you could interpret this, this, these pat, little patches of lucent here as attempted bird's nest, if you were um, so inclined. Very neutropenic patient, so definitely a setup for fungus. He was on voriconazole um, or some other conazole as a suppressant against aspergillus. So these lesions arrived despite that. So with these findings, you know, raising the question, could this be Legionella mcdadii? Does, you know, bilaterality would be kind of good for that. The symmetry would be good for that, as opposed to fungal infection like mucor. Um, so they treated him for both and um, PCR came back. What do you think PCR came back? What's, what's the consensus, fungus? Or could this be Legionella mcdadii? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Was it was it in the cardia, something weird. It was no cardia. <laughs> okay. Well, this What's some other fungus? Fungus. Go ahead. No, some other fungus too. You've shown some really unusual fungal organisms. Okay. Well, this turns out to be uh, Rhizopus. It's Rhizopus uh, microsporus, uh, which is. Uh, a fungus, you know, in nature that attacks wood and likes to break down plants. Also has an interesting symbiotic relationship with uh, Burkholderia. It actually supports Burkholderia, which then adds to the necrosis of the in the host and kills a lot of cells. And then that improves the environment for uh, the the rhizopus to uh, feed on this decaying material. So. Um, Interesting symbiosis in this, but this was this was mucor. It's Rhizopus microsporus. Okay, so um, you know I've seen I've seen probably I have five cases of microsporus in my in my database, and that isn't comprehensive. So Rhizopus, and then this happens to be microsporus. And, and okay, in the cases I've seen they look exactly like mucor because it's this I think it's the same family mucoralis, but mm -hmm. Isn't rhizopus the bread mold that people always, the black bread mold? Well, there are all different kinds of rhizopus. Ah. This is, this microsporus likes, you know, uh, decaying plant material, but gets into people. And there's a case of a diabetic person, I found a case report of a diabetic person who um, was planing wood or he was chipping wood or something like that. So he was out in the field. And so he was liberating a lot of wood dust and got, um, and because of his diabetes was a little susceptible and then picked up a rhizopus lung infection. It's commonly a skin infection. It can get other parts of the body, skin, liver, spleen, and lung. So rhizopus in a uh, neutropenic patient. I just read that uh, there's a domestic form of that species that you mentioned that's used to make uh, fermenting soy products into like tempeh. <laughs> That's right. It's uh, it is actually used in the food industry. So it's um, you know it's uh, you know it's it's friend and foe. You have to <laughs> you know nature nature is not um, exclusive. Okay. So here's a person with this uh, older chest radiograph showing a little bit of atelectasis uh, in the bases here. Maybe a little peribronchial crud down here. This is the guy's baseline. He has um, multiple sclerosis. So he has some you know, compromise in his swallowing ability. Um, and he's got this crud in the base, which could be aspiration or the residual from aspiration. And then um, then he showed up here with a complete whiteout here of the left hemithorax. And notice that the trachea is being dragged to the left here. So it looks as if there's some degree of volume loss, but for the degree of whiteness here, it looks as if there must be something balancing that uh, that collapse. This is not just a lung collapse because the volume is fairly well maintained. There's some shift to the mediastinum, but it's not huge the way you'd expect with a complete collapse. And notice that we can see um, a, a fair amount of aerobronchogram here going to upper and into least proximal left lower lobe. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it looks as if there's probably a balancing pleural effusion here. So I confidently diagnosed that this was probably a combination of lung collapse plus pleural effusion resulting in this so whiteout with uh, fair, uh, not that much shift. But let's uh, see what CT showed here. And again, there's probably going to be a little server delay here. Stay tuned. It's worth it. Okay. So 
as we scroll through this, we see that the um, lung volume is fairly well maintained. There is a little bit of pleural effusion around the lung here, but most of this tissue that we're seeing here on the left, most of the whiteness is, is, uh, is condensed lung, it's airless lung, but the lung hasn't collapsed that much. So this is really, this corresponds more to a drowned lung here. So we've got drowned lung, which has maintained its volume, but doesn't have any air in it. So presumably there's fluid or something else in the lung that's making up for the volume. There is some mediastinal shift and there is some pleural effusion. Then let's look at the other side. Uh, look at the right lung base while, while we have this window. And we have these finger-like uh, opacities, which seem to be tracking along the pulmonary arteries. So we have these accompanying, if you look down here, these accompanying tubular structures that are not opacified that are traveling with the arteries, the opacified arteries. And so this is, as you probably have suspected, as somebody with multiple sclerosis and does, by the way, does have some compromise of this left lower lobe bronchus. Um, this is aspiration. And so these tubular structures here that are not opacified that accompany pulmonary arteries are the aspirate filled bronchi to the uh, lower lobe. And then we have some aspiration bronchiolitis. So I've never seen such extensive tubular filling here in the setting of aspiration as this case. There's a fairly small amount of aspiration bronchiolitis, but a whole lot of central uh, bronchial filling, which probably reflects that this guy does not have a very good cough with his uh, neuromuscular problems. So a uh, case of dramatic aspiration here with drowned lung on the left, maintained volume, but airlessness of that left lung, only a little bit of pleural effusion, to my surprise, and then these very nice bronchial casts here of uh, aspirated material. Yeah, very dramatic. Okay. All right. Those are my two uh, two cases of people with shortness of breath in the last so, couple of weeks. Thank you. All right, Seth, are you ready? Yeah, I'll shoot through mine pretty quick. Um, did you send me the uh, little... Oh, there it is. It's hiding. Uh, now I have to figure out which screen is which. All right. So um, just to show you, I just anonymized this one. Um, you know, a case with a clot with a shaggy margin um, that one of our, um, it was called, it was bigger before. It was called a sarcoma on the outside. Uh, the patient was put on anticoagulation, which I think is the reason for the shagginess. Um, there was still, when, you know, raised concern for sarcoma based on this. They thought there might be a mediastinal component. I, I really didn't think so. But just to confirm, we got a MR. Um, and I'll, I'll skip the SSFP, but I'll just show the, uh, you know, this is the 600 millisecond delayed inversion time. Um, kind of a nice way to recognize clot, how dark it is compared to normal soft tissue. There was no, on other images, anything outside of the, the vessel. So this was all um, just clot that had that shaggy margin. But again, I think that was primarily secondary to uh, anticoagulation. Um, this is a case that's, you know, it's it just scary because, um, you know, it's one of those things if you're, you're just going to miss it, uh, I think, without any history. I don't even know what the history was. I think it was a um, patient that was signs of a stroke. And um, they intubated him. He wasn't doing super well. And um, the finding here is this little bit of thickening along the esophagus and blurring of the wall between the esophagus and the atrium. And I think on one slice, if I can find it, there it is that little dot of air. Mm. And I think yep. um, most of us know what this is from, but here is the, he wonder went before this a CT stroke angiography, and it was very nicely picked up that there was actually uh, air in the left atrial appendage. Um, this was read out as being secondary to a they thought either a PFO or ASD with injection of air across 
uh, they didn't have, they didn't see the esophageal findings. They didn't have a history which shows that uh, the patient underwent uh, pulmonary vein ablation um, about three weeks before. And, uh, but it was fine because the actual surgeon knew what was going on immediately. And then here's his brain um, DWI and needless to say, not very good. So uh, esophageal atrial fistulas, rare but very devastating complication of ablations. I've seen about, uh, people show me cases I've seen myself. Um, maybe, again, someone showed me in this cases, I've come across one. Uh, but again, the amount I've seen are probably about seven or eight. And I was telling like my guys, you know, I, I had a, I, someone showed me a case that they were actually litigating for the prosecution that this finding and that it was missed and the person died. So I, I don't, not going to judge that person. They're a good radiologist, but uh, you know, the, this will invariably go to, uh, to a lawsuit. Um, fortunately here, there was obviously no delay in diagnosis because the surgeon knew what was going on, but extremely subtle. And I think without, you know, if you had a history recent ablation, you know, th then you're a little bit, uh, not as much of an excuse, but, um, again, uh, it's just a very tough case, uh, but a very classic finding. Now this, I still don't, can't figure this thing out and it upsets me. Um, so let me go back to here. Is this the right case? Yeah. So here's a case I read the other yesterday. And this is a guy who's coming in, he has a pneumonia in the right upper lobe, it's whatever, he's, he's immunocompromised. And I notice that um, the walls of this, what look like intimal calcifications or something are, are now displaced. And I wasn't, you can see here, it, there's this bending and I wasn't sure what it was. it was calcification or just high density, but you can see. And the crazy thing about it was that it was new from like a study a month before, or at least I didn't see it. Um, so, I mean, you, you really don't see that. So I was concerned. I, I said, oh, geez, this guy's got to have a dissection. Um, and... I said, you know, it took me forever to track down with some outpatient and I couldn't get in touch with the docs. We've all been there before. And it wasn't. It was just ulcerated plaque. Um, and it was just ulcerated plaque. I, that, that's it. Or, you know, just mural thrombus with some plaque ulceration. But I still can't figure out for the life of me, maybe one of you guys can, why it has this appearance on the non-con CT. He is anemic. His blood does measure basically near fluid attenuation, but it was the same on the prior study. Um, so clearly this is some interface with maybe fresh blood products or products that are a little fresher, but, I, I, it, but I'm not sure why it's new from the study, you know, a few weeks prior. Anyway. Is renal disease? No. Oh, he has renal wow. disease. He does have renal disease, but he's, um, he does. I don't know if that could contribute, but yeah, I don't have any other explanation. But I would think it would be the same. He's on end stage renal disease for a long time. And I, I called up the thing. I was like, this guy has a dissection. And then you read the CT and you're like, well, it's good that he doesn't, but man, you know, it makes me sound like an idiot. But, um, well, I guess it's good that you're wrong for his sake in this case. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I said it wouldn't be the first time I sounded like an idiot. But uh, anyways, so this was a very nice case, but not good for the patient. Seth, Seth there's any chance that that's fresh thrombus that's being deposited on? Well, well, that's what I was saying. That's exactly what I said. It may be just some fine layering fresh thrombus. That that's that's the only thing I can think of. But it, to be everywhere, I I don't know. But that's what I presumed it has to be, or you know, his blood is still measuring like 18 Hounsfield units um, on both studies. Uh, Were there other arteries that, that formed new calcifications like that too? Um, not, I mean, it was just a chest and the belly was done with just with contrast, but not, 
I mean, I guess maybe you can see a little line here, but not. You know, but there's not, something the right pectoral muscle too. If you go back up, uh, there's some. Oh, uh, this. Yeah, what's that stuff? I don't know. It's a non-con study. I guess it has to be some sort of dystrophic calcification, or maybe related to his renal failure. Was that there a few weeks ago too? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no. Huh. So is it like like I mean, if it was just the muscle thing, you would you would call it like metastatic. Like from like increased calcium, uh, uh, yeah, metastatic pulmonary calcification, but yeah. I, I've never seen it. In, you know, this is his lungs, yeah, and this aorta, is yeah. oh, this is yeah. pneumonia. I mean, he has great, and it's getting it's getting better. Um, I mean, geez, I, I guess maybe it's like Travis said, maybe related something to his renal failure. Um, I just, anyways, I've never seen this pattern before. But you're right, that that is new up there. I like the renal failure business, and you know, because he's uh, he could have a, a worsening of his renal failure with his acute, you know, uh, clinical situation. And he 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 has. Uh, you're right. I mean, he uh, he just had chronic renal failure. That was the history. Um, but I didn't check for a change. But you you he was acutely ill. I mean, he's got a bad viral pneumonia. That actually is not COVID. Um, and uh, so maybe it, it is related to worsening renal function or like the increase what is it like the calcium phosphate product if, if that goes up it can <clears throat> deposit calcium everywhere calcium yeah, being yeah. deposited in thrombus peripheral thrombus <laughs> that's, a, that's really a very interesting that's a, that's a yeah, good policy in stage renal disease patients and i've never seen that yeah that's really bizarre yeah so this is a case of a unfortunate uh patient who came in with chest pain underwent a CTA of the aorta and one of a radiologist, this is not a CTA of the aorta. This is, uh, and it was a non-gated study, but acutely, astutely picked up this um, kind of left main pseudoaneurysm with a very tight, very, very tight left main. And I don't even understand our, like, she came in with a, a troponin bump and chest pain and cardiology is basically is like, eh, it's nothing. You know, it's she's twenty year old woman, and uh, they, you know, dilly dallied for a while. And eventually, after this, and you can also see there's the thickening of the wall of the aorta, um, and there is also thickening of other vessels. Um, I think one of the carotid arteries may be out, or some other. I have to look at it closer, but I was told other vessels are out. You can see the thickening around the, so this is clearly going to be a vasculitis. So unfortunately they, or well, fortunately slash unfortunately, um, where is my movie? Where did it go? Let me try to load this again. That's going to do this pain in the butt stuff. So this is them trying to get pie this thing. And then they've already opened up the, uh, the, um, the obstruction, but as, as people can see, um, this is not a good rhythm for the heart to be in when you're messing with it. Uh, cause that, that's not a rhythm. That's just twitching. So she coded, um, during this procedure and this is when she's coding. Um, and she had, I think she was down for a really long time, but amazingly, um, she has no real, uh, let me try to get this thing here. You can see that really tightness by the pseudo. So it's really a pseudo aneurysm. Um, at least to me, it looked like a pseudoaneurysm. It's very eccentric, all the inflammatory changes around it. So this is a case of Takayasu's. Uh, you can see the aortic stuff. And we just had that one. Um, and what is this case? Hey, Seth, oh. I've seen a couple of cases of Takayasu with coronary, and it's usually osteal involvement. I've never seen them try and intervene, though, even if it's tight. Was it because of the pseudoaneurysm, or was no, it the it was because she was basically in left main infarcting. Okay. So she had a troponin bump. You know, I just for the sake of time, I won't show, but I'll send the images if I ever send my yeah. cases. Um, that you can see that the there's hypoperfusion, subendocardial hypoperfusion in left main territory. The left main territory is down. So she was actively infarcting. Um, that's why they they intervened. Okay. And they stented that and um, yeah. 
Not, not that there probably makes a, a huge difference, but do you think that could be Kawasaki's? No. No. No, like, she has. Like, she's got disease everywhere. Looks um, like even a pulmonary artery. Like yeah, the I mean, main PA has a little wall thickening. Yeah, there's thickening here. I mean, the descending thoracic aorta is, you know, really involved. Um, she had a belly study which showed involvement of vessels. You know, she's got arch vessel involvement. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't put. Um, and we, yeah, you one, know, of, one, of, one of we had a I had a similar case, uh, and uh, one of our interventional cardiologists said that he thought it could be Kawasaki too. And I I don't know. I guess the Kawasaki occasionally is reported as having involvement of the abdominal aorta too, but I don't I don't know. Yeah, I I, I don't yeah. No, I agree with Seth. I've seen we've seen a lot of cases on this cases of Kawasaki with with that's very typical osteo coronary involvement too. Yeah. yeah the rest yeah. of the coronaries are fine. Yeah, the coronary, I mean, coronaries were otherwise completely normal. Um, yeah, and Travis has shown a couple of cases. I've seen a couple of cases. It, it's, it's common, um, unfortunately common in these. And, and you're right, there's just disease. The more you look, there's just disease everywhere. PAs, aorta, the, ver the left vert was gone. Um, there's circum... Oh, and the other thing I, I just wanted to show for teaching, because... Um, one of my attendings was concerned. You remember on non-contrast studies, these vasculitises can be, or vasculitides, can be high in attenuation. Um, and she was concerned that there was a uh, intramural hematoma. Remember, intramural hematomas are really crescentic, where this mm -hmm. is kind of circumferential. And I've seen every vasculitis from um, Kawasaki's, not Kawasaki's, um, Taki, whatever, large cell vasculitis, whatever you want to call it, Takiasus or... Um, uh, giant, giant cell, cell. or um, I've seen it with IgGA or IgG um, uh, aortopathies very and we actually had a case in Maryland where someone actually underwent had an IgG um, aortopathy and uh, had its crescentic high attenuation came with chest pain at crescentic high attenuation around the I'm not it's not crescentic circumferential and they actually took the patient to surgery for a type A intramural hematoma and all it was was a vasculitis um, Fortunately, that didn't turn into a legal case, but uh, it could have uh, because we called it uh, an IMH. So just remember circumferential, um, you can see with vasculitis. Why? What's causing that? I think it's the fibrosis, the inflammation, and the fibrosis in the walls. That's what I always mm. ascribed it to, mm. but, I, I, but I don't know. I mean, there is just a mat of inflammation in the wall, um, but I, Dave, I would have to find out why that's more, we know fibrotic tissue is more hyperattenuating. And I, I'll pull over, I'll bring over that IgG case again. I mean, the whole wall, not even the wall, the meat, the epicardial fat, the mediastinal fat was so inflamed. Um, I just assumed a lot of it was fibrotic tissue. Uh, and then really quickly, just because I've never seen this before, but I'm sure you all have. Uh, I haven't, I just don't see these a lot. You know, this is some young guy comes in with this weird cystic thing with gunk in it, a better word. And then it got, um, comes in a few months later with worsening fever and cough. And now that area is completely consolidated and has kind of air bubbles within it. Uh, and this was a CPAM. And then here it is uh, after they, kind of treated it. This was a CPAM that got inf uh, infected with non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease. I can't remember which species it was. So, um, yeah. you know, they get, we know they get infected. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see, here's, the, I don't, I think I took out the, yeah, I took out anything. Conge CPAM, non-necrotizing granulomatous inflammation, and they basically said it was, um, uh, on a on the it was uh, AFB positive and it was suspicious for acid bacillus and it was non tuberculous mycobacterial disease. Anyways, Jeff, those are uh, those are my cases. Awesome, thank you. All right, let's see. We've got Travis and Peter. I have some. All right. Okay. I'll just show two so that. Other people still have time. Okay, this is a recent case, uh, iatrogenic complication. This is the preoperative radiograph. They were undergoing tricuspid and mitral valve repair. The heart 
doesn't really look that big. The atria don't look huge. But this is a couple days post-op and just typical post-op, the portable aorta looks, a, the mediastinum looks a little wide, just portable technique. It's what I would say, this is a couple days after that. So this is five days after surgery. And around this time she codes. And I don't really see much change or anything that I would say here. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment. I, it, I think this is just, as it was called, just like routine post-op, a little bit of basilar junk. That's not the issue. So they did a CTA. This was chest, abdomen, and pelvis. They were looking for bleed, looking for any reason that she could have coded. And you can see on the non-con even that there's an issue here. And, and there's a, a, the aortotomy, the cannulation site here, a little felt pledget. And this is the, the arterial phase of that same study. You can see that she has a massive type A dissection now. And I think this was pointed out that there's a little bit of blush right next to that aortotomy site. So that was the thought was that this was arising, certainly involving or arising from there. And the problem too is that her left main is not looking great at all. And because this was an abdomen, uh, abdomen and pelvis CTA as well, they always do delay for the abdomen and pelvis. And I think this is one of the most impressive mm -hmm. infarcts I've ever seen on delayed imaging. And you can see her left ventricles dilated at this point in time as well. And they did go to surgery. Not sure the prognosis here, but this was confirmed as a dissection that they, the surgeon thought was originating from the cannulation site right here involving the left main coronary artery and then extending through the rest of the visible uh, thoracic aorta and into the abdominal aorta. So pretty unfortunate catastrophic complication from another what should be seemingly routine valve repair. Uh, but Seth, I'm imagining your the Takayasu delayed looked somewhat like this, you know, decreased perfusion. So whether it's ischemia or, or infarct, you know, this is this was one of the more extensive ones I've seen. Travis, is that a um, dissection or or uh, intramural hematoma? It's a dissection. They because oh, um, in the in the descending aorta, I can see uh, side yeah. branch aneurysms. I mean, it's um, a dissection here. Chair. What what whether it's whether you know some of this is just thrombosed. You know, I don't. They they just said it was a dissection arising from here. I mean, again, yeah. the the semantics of of you know if it's a thrombose dissection at this point or or if this is you know, how much of this is intramural hematoma, but there's clearly a defect here. Oh, can you scroll down on the descending a little bit? Um, yeah, like right there. Yeah, because uh -huh. you see some. Yeah, and so there's probably some some filling. There's yeah. probably some fenestrations filling here, or maybe these are just side branch. The little branch artery pseudoaneurysm from intercostals. I don't know. And then I'll just show this one um, really quick, get everyone's thoughts. This is a, a patient that was referred to us with a diagnosis of, of well, for further workup of a otherwise unknown cystic lung disease. This was an abdomen and pelvis CT done a couple of years ago, and. In fact, she had several abdomen and pelvis CTs. At least one of them was screening for AMLs, you know, with this presumptive diagnosis of of a of a cystic lung disease. And you know, we've seen cases. I'm just curious what you think because when I looked at this, my initial reaction, which is still, I agree with myself, is that this is not a cystic lung disease. That this is just central lobular emphysema. I agree with and you. You can see some of these areas. Yeah, and you can see like a lot of these areas, they almost want to have walls, but they don't really have walls. And you can see the, the vessels coursing through them. And I can't remember if it was David or Seth that one time like used the term discrete emphysema for some of these. Because I had one way back when at Emory that ended up going to surgical lung biopsy and came back as central lobular emphysema. But yeah, do you guys agree? I yes. think that um, yeah, it's emphysema. I mean, it's definitely it's possible, but I also think that cysts from protein deposition may produce cystic spaces like this as well. 
quite a few of them, like there on the right upper lobe, and one particularly in the left lower lobe, um, have residual tissue in, and one can see that in cysts that arise from deposition oh. of protein in lung, as in Children's syndrome, or other entities that produce those cysts. So that's what I would consider as well. I guess my question, and, and certainly Howard, you've seen the most, I think, cases of, of light chain or amyloid deposition, but do you mm -hmm. ever see poles that don't have walls with amyloid? Like, do you ever see you know, cysts without definable walls? Because I agree with you, and some of this may just be vessels passing, like here, almost looks like it's just a vessel running along the wall of this space. Yeah, I think I see this, and, and particularly when I see strands of tissue within, in multiple locations in the larger spaces that you've shown, mm -hmm. I would actually put protein deposition nine out of but 10, is, likely. But this is very typical of central ovular emphysema too, to get the vessels yes, yes, passing yes, straight right true. through the middle. Right. But this is an unusual distribution of everyday central ovular emphysema where it's kind of everywhere rather than say the upper lung zone. So I think the distribution just on the face of it is and against everyday smoking related central ovular emphysema. Yeah, I mean, short of a lung biopsy, they've done a workup, you know, I told them, because of the other case we've seen, I know, Seth, didn't Jeff Galvin show you a case too that you shared with us that looked very similar to this? Yeah, and he thought it was going to be some cystic lung disease, but it, it actually wound up being emphysema. Yeah. Um, and I've I had a ca couple cases like this that have now gone to open lung biopsy. I think we all have right. that it's just emphysema. It'd be interesting to see if we could pull all the ones with. Yeah. I, have seen I just want to make one caveat that sometimes the pathologist's reading is not the answer because they might see spaces that they call emphysematous spaces. And if they don't know the context, they will reach a conclusion that is not necessarily the truth. And yeah, but emphysema and, and cystic disease due to amyloid or light chain deposition, I mean, they look dramatically different under the microscope. I mean, uh, it's, they really sure. do. I mean, they're, one completely destroys and replaces the underlying architecture of the lung and fills it with these cystic areas, and the other are um you know just hyperinflated alveoli I, I don't know i mean that's the ones i've looked under the microscope that i've been shown i mean they they don't look similar I mean, clearly this causes confusion because we've all seen you know, we have more than a half dozen cases that have gone to surgical lung biopsy so it's not always an you know an easy thing i mean i tend to think this is I put a lot of money on this being central ovular emphysema just because most of these have no discernible wall at all. But, but to, you know, it'd be yeah. interesting if we pulled together all of the ones that have surgical lung biopsies. So I I would I would you know I <clears throat> I agree with your main your main point that these are not what we should call cysts because they mostly because they're not empty. They've got tissue strands in the middle and that that goes nicely with emphysema. I've seen cases of amyloidosis that have a combination of cysts, which are beautifully empty, and emphysema too. So I think that Howard's point that this, you know, you could see findings like this where the lung is being eaten up in the setting of light chain deposition or other protein deposition in the lungs. And, you know, the mechanism is the same with emphysema and with the light chain deposition disease. Basically, you're activating these uh, destructive cells like macrophages and neutrophils, which bring their enzymes and they start digesting the lungs. So one way, the lung gets digested in emphysema, the lung gets digested in protein deposition. So, you know, I've seen emphysema in, uh, along with uh, amyloid in the lung, and we all see emphysema in, uh, you know, just in cigarette smokers. I think the interesting thing here is I would call this discrete emphysema. Uh, and the question is, why why is it discrete rather than more generalized? Mm -hmm. why, why do these holes seem to be so separate from other emphysematous patches? Right. So I, I don't think anybody really has an idea, but I, I would call this emphysema and not cysts. And maybe there's a couple of foci of paraseptal emphysema as well. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, I, I think these are always interesting because obviously 
when you invoke cystic lung disease, then a patient gets a million dollar workup. Right. All right. All right, Jeff. Good discussion. All right, Peter and Brian, we have five minutes. You think we can squeeze them in? Talk fast. I have a few, but I yeah. can show some of them and okay. show a few of the other ones. I have five total. I'll show my two um, infections in um, immunosuppressed patients since that came up earlier. Um, so this one is a um, young guy. He's 35, and he um, he has a heart transplant. Um, and he's had about a month of uh, fevers, shortness of breath. Uh, he started having right shoulder pain, and he has a bunch of um, pustules on his skin everywhere, um, which drained uh, pus. And so he uh, he's also been admitted previously for a sternal infection um, and some other uh, infections. So he this time he comes in and um, the new findings on his um, chest CT are these um, round nodules uh, at the base is here. And so uh, immunosuppressed. He's on all the immunosuppressants for trans. Um, and then he also had a. Uh, positive uh, cryptococcal antigen um, titer. So um, and I've seen cryptococcus, pulmonary cryptococcus and solid organ transplants uh, come up with basically look like multiple nodules like that. So I thought I thought that made sense. Um, but then a few days later, I followed up with the uh, 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 clinical diagnosis and they um, he also had a positive culture from uh, one of the skin pustules. Um, uh, for uh, trichosporin, uh, 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 one of the trichosporin uh, species. Uh, so they, they they thought this was invasive uh, uh, trichosporin. Um, and uh, basically that can cause, uh, they're, they, they, they're saying that that also causes uh, cross reactivity with the cryptococcal antigen. So that's, um, so that's the clinical there. And he's on varconazole, which I think should cover uh, cryptococcus too, but I I don't have a whole lot of uh, I haven't seen uh, trichosporon really um, disseminated and these really di this didn't really doesn't seem convincing for disseminated because um, there's just some nodules in the lower lobes so if anything it looks more like he formed granulomas here um, but um, I was wondering if any of you guys have, have any experience with trichosporon disease in the lungs. You know, I think I do, but I'll, I'll have to dredge up a case. Maybe I can bring it next time. I Googled and it doesn't seem like it's super common, but yeah. Um, so now was he smoking marijuana by any chance? I don't know. It'd be worth finding out. I think that the case of, I think the case of trichosporin, if it's the one I'm remembering, was associated with uh, marijuana smoking. I will dredge up that case. Yeah. Okay, I'll show one other quick one. This one, no. So this patient has a um, history of, so I'll show the CT chest first. So some cysts here in the lungs. Um, they look kind of perivascular. Um, I'm withholding the history for now, but uh, and here's, so this was from a few months, this was from June, and then this is from a few days ago, and you can see the cysts have gotten a lot bigger. Um, there's a pneumothorax. This patient has uh, angiosarcoma of the scalp. So these are, uh, is a good example of um, cystic mets from angiosarc. And, it seems like one of them is ruptured here and uh, caused a pneumothorax, so worsening um, cystic mets. Yeah, see very commonly. Nice example. Yeah, and I will uh, leave my other ones for 
next time. All right. well, I have two. I have two cases of trichosporon. One was a person with bronchiectasis that had a fungal nodule, it was resected, <clears throat> possibly yeast or reactivated histoplasmosis, but it 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 turned out to be trichosporon. Um, yeah. By sequencing, and so the other trichosporon. Relapsed AML person with trichosporin uh, Asahi pneumonia, Asahi E pneumonia, um, with nodules. Okay. The, the one that they grew here is tri, uh, trichosporin uh, Inkai, Inkai, which gives all the skin um, nodules, skin abscesses. Um, but there's several different ones. So, yeah. All right, uh, Brian, we, we could do one case if you have one. Uh, sure, uh, actually I just closed them. <laughs> uh, leave, uh, so maybe next week. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. That's fine. All right, everybody, it's the top of the hour. So thank you very much and talk thank to you. Thank you, nice to see you, Ryan. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.